What is up, guys? Aster here. Uh, if this is your first time seeing me, hi. Um, <laughs> I've done videos like this before in the past. Uh, this is a very different video than what I usually do. Um, it's, uh, it's, I guess, kind of serious. We'll try to make it comical, too. But um, basically, I'm going to be highlighting uh, my journey, I guess you could say, over the last year, um, year and a half almost, through draft league format. Now, a lot of you guys uh, know what draft league format is. For those of you that don't, that only watch my showdown content, uh, which I'd be surprised if you were still around because I have not uploaded showdown content in a long time. But uh, basically, draft league format is where you have a set number of teams. Uh, you draft like a sports league. Each person gets a set amount of uh, mons. It can be between nine to twelve usually. Uh, some are fixed uh, per number of uh, Pokemon that you can draft, some are uh, a little more liberal, and uh, you get a uh, team that you use throughout a season, you can make transactions with other players or with what's left available after the draft and throughout the season, and uh, you try to make it to playoffs and then standard playoffs like any sport, and you try to win a championship, so pretty basic rundown. Uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of a history of my uh the leagues that i've been in basically and everything that has uh, happened uh to me throughout this time so the first thing i'm going to highlight is of course the very first league that took me in which was uh the upa the upa is uh, made up of a lot of my close personal friends uh if you guys don't know it then i suggest you uh check out uh little bigness uh drew he is the commissioner uh, you guys might know a lot of people in the UPA. Greg was in last season. Uh, I was in this season, but I had to drop out, unfortunately, because time constraints with the GBA D League, with the NPL Majors now starting up. So um, this was my very first league, and this was the very first first draft that I ever did was UPA Season 5. They were already into their fifth season uh, when I came along last year, so that they move really, really quick. Uh, through their seasons. This one's a little bit longer actually. They have 15 weeks this time, which is ridiculous. It's pretty insane. Uh, not like it's it's bad or anything, but it's it's a lot. So uh, that is the UPA. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. I actually got really lucky to uh, get started in this league because I was just hanging out on Showdown and uh, somebody approached me and asked me if I wanted to be part of their league. And this was Drew, Little Bigness. Uh, I was like, is it draft league? He's like, yeah, it is. I'm like, no way. He saw me play and he was impressed by my uh, by my play. And this was like a week or two into me starting YouTube and starting uh, recording and everything. So that was really, really lucky. And I just want to give a huge, huge shout out to the UPA, everybody in it. Thank you for uh, having me and uh, giving me the opportunity to start up in draft league format. Uh, very kind of you all. Everybody was really nice. Uh, except a select few, but we won't talk about those. But anyway, that's uh, that's the UPA. And in conjunction with the UPA, I actually got even more lucky. Uh, if you guys remember, uh, I used to talk about this all the time, but there was uh, there was a an SPL-type league that was starting up between a bunch of people in the community. Uh, they wanted to do their own. They called it the PWM, which is the Pokemon World Majors, I believe. And... Um, Somebody uh, ran into me once again on the ladder, uh, saw me play, and this was Jar, my co-analyst for the GPA uh, Power Rankings uh, last season, and uh, he found me and he's like, do you want to join a league? It's like SPL, and at the time, I wasn't interested in joining anything Smogon related, other than just doing singles on my channel, uh, in the OU tier and other tiers, of course, but I was like, you know what, let's just do it, uh, let's go for it, and we'll see where it goes. And the, PUM, uh, the PWM excuse me, resulted in me meeting pretty much everybody that was in the NBA. Uh, and the NBA is, of course, a league made up of myself, Jar, uh, Johnny, Ricepool. Um, there's now Dan Donicky, he wasn't originally in, though. The Dom's Game Room, Jose, uh, Eric, Colton, all these people that were pretty much the stepping stones for the beginning of my channel and really gave me a huge amount of support when I made my giveaway video for uh, Pokemon Sun and Moon. I uh, pretty much asked them for as much help as they could give, and they shared that video everywhere they could. They, they did my PR for me, so huge shout-outs to all of those guys. But we're really focusing on the league itself, and this is the second time that I was drafting. Uh, in comparison, actually, looking at the two drafts uh, that I drafted, the NBA was far superior uh, to what I had drafted in the UPA. I made a ton of drafting mistakes with the UPA, but it, it is a tiered system, and I never really liked their tiers personally. 
uh, they if, if they like them that's fine that's that's up to them they, they make their own tiers um, however they choose but anyway the point is uh, I'm really confused with my hair because on my cam it's going one way and on my head it's going another way anyway I got a pretty cool haircut here but let me move this out of the way. Go up, you. Thank you. All right. Um, anyway, uh, moving on. So these were the uh, the two first leagues that I were I was in, and I met uh, everybody, including Rob. I, I wanted to save Rob for last because uh, Ray, uh, also known as Pokey Rob, or Robin Vart at the time, was a huge integral part uh, into me being a part of the draft league community as I am right now. Uh, because after the UPA and the NBA started, both uh, kind of died. Uh, the UPA I struggled in and I did not make playoffs. And the NBA just died altogether, uh, much as their season three did, uh, their season two, excuse me, and that was season three. Uh, but then an opportunity arose and uh, I was invited by... Uh, well, something else happened in the meantime, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, I was invited by Ray to replace him permanently in the GPC, which uh, I believe was a co uh, co started by uh, El Scizor. If I'm not mistaken, at least he was a very uh, important part of the league. He really got it off uh, off its bearings, basically uh, made, made it what it was because uh, he already had a pretty big following from the GBA. And uh, I was uh, asked by Rob. Well, actually, I, I personally suggested it and I was like the first person in contention for his spot. I grabbed this team. That was probably one of my favorite teams ever to use, uh, especially in Gen 6 uh, as a draft team. Uh, I went into it blind, not knowing uh, what I was getting myself into, how good the players were in that league. There were a lot of really good players. This is the first time that I saw Shoddy, uh, Merc, uh, Ethan, uh, Redithan, of course. Will was there, uh, which is Makati. And uh, I knew Makati from the D-League, actually, uh, from watching him in the D-League uh, in Season 2. And it was kind of like, whoa, somebody from uh, the GBA is here. And I had already known um, Ray, who was also in the GBA at the time as an analyst. So that was already a, a really big thing. So that's the GPC. I took over that team. We'll talk more about results and placing after. But uh, after the GPC, uh, I decided to start my, well, in conjunction with Johnny. Johnny was the first person to suggest it. It might have been Dom, actually. Uh, Johnny started the execution and I really took it off, uh, which was the uh, GOT formerly known as the uh, Goodbye Oris tournament and rebranded afterwards into the uh, Grand Overseas tournament uh, just to fit the generation, of course, because we weren't saying goodbye to Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire anymore. Uh, it was a an open draft, free draft system, which I had never done up until that point <clears throat> where anybody could draft any seven mons. We were really limited, though. Uh, we only had seven. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like super competitive, I guess you could say, and then nobody really had walls to anything, uh, but it was a fun tournament. The first time we did it uh, was 32 people. The second time was an absolute disaster. It's a lot more recent. Uh, I, for some reason, allowed 128 uh, participants, and that was more than I could handle, and I'm never making that mistake again. I'm going to restrict it to 64 at the most. Uh, I got a lot of help from uh, some really good admins, a lot of my close personal friends, mainly from the NBA, of course, and the UPA, actually, uh, and it uh, it finished, at least. It did, it did finish, but we always have this problem with the GOT for some reason where we have trouble uh, making it end and keeping people in line and getting their games done, so uh, maybe I'm not a great commissioner. Uh, maybe that's not what I'm cut out to be. So, lesson learned, but I'm still going to try to keep it going. It's a fun tournament and people seem to really enjoy themselves. Uh, afterwards, uh, a couple more opportunities presented themselves. Mainly the following season of the GPC, which I participated in. I drafted my own team. That was the team with uh, Zygarde 50%. At this point, we were already into uh, Generation 7, um, Zygarde 50 and Jirachi and Megalopony, that team, if you guys remember it. Um, sorry, I got a little itch there. And uh, so we were back in the GPC once again, just getting that logo back up. And uh, season six, I believe, started up. And I ended up being an admin as well for that season, which is kind of cool. Uh, I still technically am an admin, but I don't actually do anything. I'm kind of just idle uh, at the moment. But if they ever really, really need my help, they just have to call on me and I'll be there. Um, because it's a league that I have a lot of uh, respect for. It's a league that took me in from nowhere. They had no idea who I was. I was not in any prominent league. My name was not massive at the time. Uh, this was even before my giveaway video, so I was under 100 subscribers. So they literally had no idea who I was outside of speaking to Ray. So 
Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so that season started up, and in conjunction uh, with that season, we also had the uh, NPL Miners tryout tournament. So this is where I want to get into this discussion right here, which is the NPL and the NPL Miners. So um, simultaneously, while replacing Rob in the GPC, um, just actually just prior to it, uh, Rob needed a replacement for him him in the uh, in the NPL in the National Pokeball League. He was playing in it. Uh, he wasn't doing too hot. He was one in three, I believe. Uh, I took over his team. I got him two wins, made him three and three, then lost to Togavar and went three and four. And then at the time, because I was so small and I didn't really know the draft league community as a whole, I just assumed that the NPL wasn't an, a, a great league because I went two and one and I wasn't a great player uh, at that time. Like I was still decent, but I was like, okay, well, look, I don't really know it uh, too well, and a lot, a lot of people in that league were annoying to me. Uh, the like the way that they spoke in their Skype chat because we were still on Skype back then. Uh, the way that they spoke in their Skype chat specifically, it was it was just one specific chat though. I didn't have access to the, to the other one, and I was like really annoyed, and I was like, I don't want to deal with these people. Uh, some of them who are now like one of my some of my closest friends in the community uh, Really awesome people. But anyway, I was just like I don't want to stick around uh, I left and then I took over for Ray in the GPC because I was like, oh my god, the GPC is a godsend uh, Lars is there will is there uh, all of these amazing players shoddy who I didn't even know at the time and got to know and found out that he was a, an amazing player too and I was just like yes I want to be part of the GPC. This is this is the big one like this is the league that's really gonna take me off and I come to find out like two weeks later <laughs> that the NPL is like the biggest and most competitive draft league right after the uh, the GBA. Uh, obviously the NPL being more competitive uh, in terms of skill and talent. It, it's a general opinion, it's not just me. Um, but the um, in terms of viewership, they also had a lot of following too. So I was like, wow, I really passed up on a huge opportunity there. And then the NPL Miners tryout tournament started. And that was my only ticket back into where I should have remained because I let Ray take back his team when he didn't even want to. He did. I don't think he even ended up playing the rest of his games uh, and he just dropped out. And I was like, okay, well, you do you. But I could have permanently taken over that team and still been in majors at this point assuming no relegation of course but uh, I passed up on a huge opportunity and I was forced to jump back in uh, into the NPL Miners tryout tournament where I actually did not do so hot it was uh, pools uh, we had like a bracket and I went one and two uh, I lost to Jarrett but I still managed to make it into the NPL Miners because uh, they have they highly value uh, good content uh, consistency, uh, skill level, which they saw that I had. Uh, they saw it when I replaced Ray, and they saw it during the tryout, uh, the the um, the tryout tournament. They saw that I had the potential to be very good, so they took me in and they allowed me to be one of the 16 coaches in the NPL minors. And uh, that's when that season started, of course, and uh, almost simultaneously with the uh, NPL in season six, I believe, when they uh, when they did the free draft. Uh, before the point system, so the season before the current one, uh, and uh, NPL Miners was actually going okay. I went, I think I went four and three, made playoffs, and uh, then lost in the first round of playoffs once again, as I as I do everywhere. But anyway, uh, once again, we won't talk about placing just yet. But um, then, obviously, uh, this season of the NPL Miners started. And halfway through the season, I got moved up to majors. So uh, that's where we are right now. And in conjunction with the uh, minors, uh, with the majors, excuse me, we also have the GBA D League going on, which was my initial goal. Uh, I don't know if I, I've talked about this before, but for my newer viewers, uh, I used to have right on this wall over here, uh, I used to have a paper, <laughs> a little paper that I wrote out at work once. And it said, all right, what are my goals with YouTube? Um, one of them was... Uh, obtain a capture card, which I now have. It's actually sitting on my desk. You guys have seen it being used in the D-League. Uh, and another one of my goals was actually to get into the D-League uh, and to be at a thousand subscribers before I did it. Uh, at the time that I wrote that out, I had no, no idea that the D-League was never going to be starting up again, or so I thought. 
And uh, according to Ray at the time, he was like, that's never happening again. I was like, okay, well now I have to go directly into the GBA, which is an issue uh, because they look for viewership there. And I know that, or at least they did at the time once again. But um, so that was like the main goal. And I was convinced that I needed like a thousand subscribers to get in. So uh, that was one of the goals that I had written out. And now looking back at it, like it's actually happening and, and I'm here. So this is where it stands right now. These are the two leagues that we have going on over here, the NPL and down over here, the, uh, the GBA D league. So, uh, I'm mainly focused on these two leagues, the NPL. I took over Togo Wars team and he was one in four and he left me with a not so hot team. So, uh, he even, <laughs> I missed this message on Discord and I wish I would have seen it. He said, sorry for the shit team. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to respond to that and just be like, it's okay, dude, it's not your fault. But um, he left me with a, a team that I personally do not like and I'm trying my best with it. Obviously, we're at two more losses now, um, but it's, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult playing field to begin with, uh, very tough opponents. And then you stack that up with the fact that I don't have the best team and my record is already bad, so the motivation to continue uh, to try to make playoffs is out the window. Uh, I'm still trying to win my games, don't get me wrong, but uh, it's all those factors together that make it so that it, the season's not going well. But I was doing really well in minors before I, I got moved up to majors because Tobe left. So that's where we stand right now. So this is uh, my history. Sorry about the camera shaking every time I touch my mouse, but that's just how it is. Um, that is the history of uh, my draft league uh, career, basically, over the last year, year and three months or so. So those are the leagues. Now, the first thing that I want to touch upon, um, and this is going to be a very educational video as well, because it's going to help a lot of newer players that are trying to get into draft league format uh, in terms of what to do, what to look out for, how to get better. Uh, those are very big topics that I'm going to be focusing on. So. The first thing I want to talk about is drafting. Obviously, uh, we touched upon this at the beginning of the video. You have to draft a team if you're playing draft league format. Uh, the first thing you want to identify is what kind of draft uh, your league or the league that you're looking to get into uh, uses. So there are three main drafting styles. Uh, tier draft, which is basically everything is placed into a tier and you need to fill out specific tiers uh, in a consecutive list of mons to create a team of a certain number between like like I said 9 and 12 usually with tiered it's normally a set fixed amount then you have um, points draft so this is highly regarded as one of the uh, most effective uh, drafting methods because it utilizes the tiering system but it breaks it down further to the point where every single mon is placed into a specific point value and you have to build a team uh, with a maximum number of points you have a budget to fill and your Pokemon that you select have to uh, not surpass that budget. Uh, we'll talk about Z-moves later, um, but th that's a different thing that can be factored in. Uh, the GBAD League now uses a, a Z-budget, uh, and other leagues have different restrictions for what kind of Z-moves and which mons can hold them and whatnot. So, I, actually, I think that pretty much covers everything, so that works there. And the final form of drafting, which uh, was, I would say, between Gen 6 and Gen 7, uh, it was starting to look like we were shifting toward that as the preferred method, but as we went on, we realized uh, this creates, um, I don't want to say a vacuum, but it creates a, um, like, a bad, <laughs> my, my wording here, uh, it, it just makes a bad time, basically. It's, um, it, it creates a bad level of competitive play um, when you allow for anybody to draft whatever they want any round. Uh, it also... Uh, makes drafting worse because players will save things that they shouldn't be saving uh, for later rounds because they feel that things of higher value will be taken uh, more often. So uh, with a uh, with a free draft, you'll see a lot of things at the beginning of the board go really, really early. Um, and then there's a lot less on the other side, like the lower valued bonds. Uh, whereas opposed to tiered and points draft, it's all it's scattered all over the place. Obviously, you're always going to have less in the lower 
uh, tiers because you're required to draft fewer of those in general. Um, and points, of course, uh, when it comes to points draft, because that was tiered. But when it comes to points draft, once again, people are still going to be looking to get the most value out of their points, so they're going to be focusing on the higher tier picks first. So, um, the, the thing that free draft does is that uh, it creates bad drafting, and it creates uh, bad teams, bad environment for competitive play, because uh, everybody's teams are either really, really stacked or really, really bad. And that's the experience that I've had with open draft, is that uh, your team is either incredible or it's just bad. Uh, NPL Miners Season 3, we uh, we did open draft, and I ended up drafting, I want to say the worst team that I've ever drafted, period. Like, uh, well, actually, maybe the NPL, uh, maybe the UPA. The UPA was a worst team. That was my very first draft. But after that point, the, the worst draft, so it's second in line, uh, would have to be the NPL Miners Season 3 because... I had Kieran Black, Mega Deancey, um, a Selgor, Flygon, Vaporeon, Delmise, Lucario, Bisharp. Like, I had, like, cool mons, but they didn't do this. They didn't mesh well together. And I often found myself in a position where I only had one defensive wall, which was Vaporeon. It, it was forced to come as, as a physically defensive wall every single time because I wanted my uh, Kieran to be a bulky, uh, a physically offensive bulky mon or especially, or mixed attacker, bulky mon. I wanted my Deancey to be uh, my wall breaker. I wanted my Flygon to be my defogger and everything had its set role and it couldn't diversify. So my Vaporeon was stuck in its role. So I think that personally for me, free draft is the lowest of the three, uh, followed by tiered. And then at the very top points draft, 100% without debate is the best way to draft uh, because everything has a point value, just as it does in a sport. So you have a you have a, a sports team uh, like hockey or um, football, for example, and you have a salary cap. Typically, uh, in most sports, I think baseball and European football uh, are the only two uh, that don't have it at the moment. Like of the most popular sports, most of the others have salary caps, and you have to make sure that your team fits within that salary cap so that no nobody gets more than anybody else, and you have to be a good coach, a good general manager, uh, and know how to use your points to get the most value. Uh, so you'll you'll see teams like hockey, for example, I'm, I'm a hockey fan, obviously. You'll see um, like general managers purposely pick up uh, players of a lower value that are l looked at as lower value to other teams as well because they fill a specific role on their team that they don't have yet, whether it be speed, whether it be puck control, um, good passing, good face-offs, anything like that. And that carries over into Pokemon. Uh, you're looking for the most value out of what you pick uh, for the amount of points that it is. And if you feel that something's too expensive, you should probably look away from it. But if it's it's a hidden gem, then you should probably be looking at it. Uh, whereas in tier draft, you're limited to five tiers. That's it. So everything gets put into a tier. Obviously, you're still looking for what is undervalued and try to pick it up as much as possible. But you still have to uh, make sure that your typings and your uh, synergy work together. So it's a little bit more restricting Whereas points draft is, I feel like the, the best of both worlds, it uses tiered and free mechanics to create the best drafting style. So uh, that's pretty much drafting. As far as what mons to pick up, uh, I'm going to actually go over a list of mons that I wrote down for myself. Obviously, this isn't going to apply to everybody, uh, but that I have personally used and that I feel uh, are of some of the highest value for the points or the tiers that they are in. So let's go over them. Um, Clefable I used during the NPL Miners. Loved it, didn't get to use it enough. Uh, Garchomp I used very, very briefly, but I know how good it is. Uh, Infernape I have used multiple times now and it has never let me down. Like this one has an asterisk on it and I only have like five or six mons that have asterisks on them. And Infernape for me, I would draft Infernape over and over and over again because this mon has just proved to be so, so valuable. It's dual stab, it's coverage, it's uh, reliable recovery, it's pivoting with U-turn, um, it's ability to just 
scare out mons, force in mons that, that allow you to pivot into things that can take advantage of them. It's just a beautiful Pokemon. Like Infernape is, and it's speed tier, especially it's speed tier, like because like Scarfed, um, I just most recently ran, I don't know when this is going out, so I'm going to keep quiet. I just most recently ran a very interesting set uh, that either you guys have already seen or that you're going to see. But um, basically, uh, there are different ways that you can use Infernape, and it's so versatile. I love it. Uh, it's not just a Scarf Sweeper. It's not just a Bandage Sweeper. It does so much. It's really, really good. Uh, Jirachi I had in the GPC as well as Tapu Bulu. I've had um, twice now, I believe. Yeah, the piece... Uh... Yeah, the NPL Miners uh, Season 4, the one that uh, I was just bumped up from, as well as uh, March Madness. Now, this is something that I didn't touch upon when I'm going through the leagues, uh, mainly because I want to talk about it uh, a little bit further into the segment, actually, so I'm going to save it for after. But anyway, Tapu Bulu, uh, I have Tornadus Incarnate, uh, sorry, uh, Thunderous Incarnate, not Tornadus, <laughs> Thunderous Incarnate, uh, I'd only just recently drafted it so far, love it, it's a great mon. Uh, I'll vouch for it. It's an amazing electric type, and it's been used against me, and it's really, really good. Uh, contrarily, I've used Thunderous Therian, and I don't really like it. A lot of people vouch for it because it has the uh, Lightning Rod ability, but its speed tier kind of restricts it. And while it is a great wall breaker, it's easily uh, taken advantage of by very, very bulky mons uh, that don't allow it to set up in front of them, and uh, it's... I wouldn't say easily outsped, but people typically have something to outspeed it and revenge it. So it's not uh, as great as Thunderous Incarnate, in my opinion. Plus, uh, the ability of, uh, to have Prankster and Defiant as abilities is really, really good. So I'm, I'll, I will always take Thunderous Incarnate over Thunderous Theory in any day. Um, and normally they're valued at the same amount, so yeah. Uh, Tornadus Therian, uh, that's why I got confused because they were right next to each other. Tornadus Therian is really good. Uh, I've had it uh, twice now, uh, now the NPL Majors just now, and I had it in the GOT, and uh, I really, really love it. It's really, uh, you can really play around with its set, so it's really good. Weavile, Weavile I've only had once, and it was in the UPA in Season 1. Uh, not Season 1, sorry, the, the first season that I was in, which was Season 5. Uh, the very first draft league that I participated in. Uh, I drafted Weavile. It was my very first pick. And I loved it. It was really good. But I think that uh, this is one that you have to watch out for because it's probably not as good in Gen 7 as it was in Gen 6 because there's a lot more fairy spam. Uh, you now have more Azumarils running around essentially with like Primarina and Tapu Fini uh, that often get drafted. So obviously Weavile can run Poison Jab. It benefits from Z moves. Uh, but it's still something that you have to be careful with. Make sure you're not overpaying for it, essentially. So, that's that. Zapdos. Zapdos. Johnny will vouch for me. This thing is so good. Uh, Zapdos is really, really good. Because it's the it's bulky enough to be an agility sweeper. And strong enough. And then it's also bulky enough to, to be defensive. So, like, it's the best of both worlds. Such a good mon. Defogger uh, gets Tailwind for team support. Uh, gets discharged for higher ch para chances, Volt Switch, and U-Turn. Like it's, um, I would say it's it's the best electric type, hands down. Like it has it has to be, if not the best, the second best, uh, just after Thunderous Incarnate. So I th I would it's debatable between those two. It's it's really tough. But uh, moving on, Zygarde, Zygarde fifty percent. I've only gotten the chance to draft it once. I would do it all over again. So this, that mod was so good. Uh, what, what? How many kills did it get me? It got me like eight, like 17, something like that in GPC Season 6. Like, it was incredible, man. Earlier this year, like at the beginning of the year, it was so, so good because people didn't... Like, uh, there's a lot more counterplay to it now. Like, people are drafting a thousand arrow resists. But uh, the mistake I made with my Zygarde was that I didn't make it my Z-mon. <laughs> I made Thunderous my Z-mon. But the problem was that... With Zygarde, uh, in the GPC, we were forced to bring our Z-Mon four times. So, uh, as a Z user, holding a Z crystal. So, I didn't want to restrict Zygarde to that because I knew how good it would be with a uh, Choice Band, uh, Choice Scarf, which I ran a lot. Um, Yachi Berry, Lumberry, all of these amazing items, leftovers uh, for a bulkier set. So, I didn't want to, like, force it to be a Z-Mon. But a lot of people are now seeing that it's an amazing Z-Mon because... Uh, your arrows resist is typically not a devastating, devastating Drake resist. So, um, the, I think there's like only one mon. There's two mons in, in the game that can resist both arrows. 
uh, and Devastating Drake simultaneously. And that is Whimsicott and Bulu, and they're both hit by Sludge Wave. So Zygarde is a ridiculously good mon. I, just, I didn't even have an asterisk next to it, but I really wanted to talk about it because more people should draft it. Like, it gets drafted, uh, obviously, in every draft now. But, like, more people have to find a way to try it out. Like, everybody has to have a round with Zygarde because it's really, really good. Mio, stop hogging it, uh, if you're watching, of course. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, after Zygarde, I have Cresselia. So I moved through the GBA tiers when I was looking through these mons. Uh, Cresselia, so good. I've only had it twice now, but... Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to explain how, how fat this thing is. Like, it's... I hate that it relies on... I think if it had Recover over Moonlight, it would be probably one of the best Psychics in the format. Like, hands down. Because Moonlight restricts it to being... Um, its recovery being affected by weather, as well as uh, only having 8 PP. So, it's it kind of sucks that that's got to be the case, but there's so much counterplay to the counterplay for Cresselia, things like Toxic and whatnot. Um, have a good um, status remover on your team, like a cleric, uh, or run rest on Cresselia. Like, there's so many things you can do. Um, it's really, really good. Diggersby, uh, I have an asterisk nest next to it because I'm not 100% confident about saying this because I enjoyed Diggersby thus far, but I used it in very limited situations. Like, I think I've only brought it to one game uh, in majors, and I didn't bring it to that many games in the GOT, so I can't fully vouch for it yet, but I will say that it's worth a try. It's definitely worth a try. Uh, Mamoswine, I've loved so far. I've had it multiple times, and uh, it's always done great work for me. Uh, having access to Ice Shard, like, that's, uh, that's a big one. Actually, I'm gonna add that into, um, hold on a second. Uh, priority, I guess? <laughs> we'll call it priority. But uh, basically, I'm always uh, looking for a couple of specific things when I'm drafting, and I'm gonna go more into detail with that later, but like Ice Shard is definitely one of them. Uh, and Mammoth Swine's great, sets up rocks, uh, it's bulky enough to take certain hits as you guys saw with the Mega Gardevoir. Um, Earth, Earth, uh, ground plus Ice Stab is so, so good. Having a good uh, electric resist as well that uh, forces people to run uh, either fighting or uh, grass coverage is really nice. It, it creates cool uh, team dynamics. Um, we have Milotic. Uh, Milotic is another mon that I used in the uh, March Madness tournament, and I think I most recently used it in the PCL as well, which of course never finished. Uh, well, technically it did. I gave the title to Merc because we were supposed to play in finals and I just couldn't be bothered. So I was just like, take it. Um, but anyway, I had Milotic. I also had Nihiligo, and that's another one. Uh, Milotic is really, really good defensively, uh, having access to things like Haze, Dragon Tail, Mirror Coat, um, all of these moves that pretty much punish setup uh, in a way, as well as being super bulky. The the fact that in Gen 7 now, Burn only does 6% and Flame Orb, uh, like people always say it when they mention Milotic now, um, it's so, so good because of Flame Orb, uh, it can really go... It can even go specially defensive now because of Flame Orb, like you don't even have to go like max, max bold. You can go max HP, a little bit of defense, like 60 EVs, and then a lot of spadef uh, with a calm nature, and then run a flame orb, and then you're super bulky on both sides. Like, you're, you're almost indestructible. It's ridiculous. Uh, you punish electrics and grasses for going for their stabs by clicking mirror code, because typically those are coming from special attackers. Typically. Uh, not always, of course. But um, there's that, and then physical attackers can't really break you, because you can punish them as well through haze, through... Uh, coverage like Ice Beam, typically things like Garchomp, Lando, Zygarde can't set up on you because of that. Like, Milotic's really, really good. And then we get into Nihiligo, and uh, Nihiligo is uh, amazing because uh, it's probably one of the most phenomenal sweepers in the metagame at the moment. Um, there's very few specific checks to Nihiligo. Very few specific typings as well that can take it on like super well the first pokemon that comes to mind is tyranitar for some reason because i think that was like the first big check to it in the ou tier um but like nihiligo can do a lot of damage uh through hidden powers through access to things like grass knot uh it's dual stab uh, thunderbolt uh, nihiligo destroyed me in march madness and that's the reason that i finished fourth uh was because of nihiligo if it wasn't for that mon i probably would have made it into the finals against mono but uh, Nihiligo destroyed me, so uh, I will vouch for it. Uh, Alola Ninetales. 
Uh, this is one mon that I absolutely love. Uh, I made it a point to grab it in free transactions when I moved up to majors because I know how good it is. Unfortunately, it doesn't work as well with the team that I have, but it's such a good value pick, guys. It's so, so good. And the GBA actually, I think, has it tiered at tier two because they're so fearful, I think, of Aurora Veil. And if Alola Ninetales were a tier three, I probably would have focused building my team in the league around Alola Ninetales and making sure that I had um, things that could take advantage of its typing, the fact that it gets Veil, its dual stab is so good. Like people don't understand this, but uh, Fairy plus Ice plus Freeze Dry is incredible. Like, it's You have to try it for yourself to understand how good it is. It single-handedly took advantage of Blake's team in the PCL week one on its own like nothing else had to do anything it was just there and it, it did damage so that's uh that's a little nine tails for you uh salamence i've had it how many times now i think three uh if i'm not mistaken npl miners no npl miners was my first time drafting it and i just picked it up again in gba d league so um yeah that's uh that's where i've had it thus far and so far i'm really really enjoying it uh, mainly from the NPL miners, obviously it hasn't gotten a chance to shine yet in the D League. You guys haven't seen even seen it yet. Um, but in the uh, in the miners, I went three weeks in a row sweeping with Salamence, and then I moved up to majors. It was like Salamence was it, like carried me on its wings into the NPL majors. <laughs> it's really corny to say, but that's pretty much what happened. Uh, it was really good on its own. Like it, it did so much work, and the team support that I had around it obviously was really awesome. Uh, things like Umbreon, Cresselia with dual screens, uh, Mega Blastoise for rapid spinning. I, I did the same thing in the NPL Miners that I'm doing now in the D-League. I picked up the same rapid spinner to complement its elements, so it's really good. Cobalion. Uh, a lot of people are calling me out on this now. I draft Cobalion everywhere I go. Uh, I got it in the... Did I get it in the PCL? I don't think I got it in the PCL. Maybe. Uh, but I got it in the GOT, and I got it in the NPL Miners. I haven't drafted it that often. Uh, but I've really enjoyed it every time I did because it's a great rock setter. It's reliable. It can take physical super effective stabs because of its great bulk. Um, of course, it depends on what kind of wall breaker it's coming from. Uh, but just like, for example, Max Attack, Adamant, Landorus can't knock out a certain invested um, Cobalion with its Earthquake. Uh, it can't do it from full. So that's like things like that blow my mind. Uh, it gets momentum with Volt Switch, which is very, very rare to see for a physical attacker. Um, typically, you'll only see that on Steel types. So there's that, or Electrics, of course, uh, that are mainly physical. But uh, no, I, I love it. It's a good setup sweeper too. It's a, it's a valid Zemon choice because of its dual stab. The fact that it can break through fairies plus everything else um, because of fighting plus Steel, of course. Uh, I really wish I got Earthquake. Like, that's the one thing Cobalion is lacking, is Earthquake. And then it would be an incredible mon, and everybody would draft it, but I really liked it. Uh, Klefki. Klefki I've had a couple of times now. Uh, and it's always done work. Every game that it comes to, it does a ton of work. Uh, it toxic Garchomp the first time I ever used it in Draft League format, and resulted in me winning because I, I wore down the Garchomp through Toxic. Um, then it got up a bunch of spikes in another game, and resulted in me winning that way. Uh, it's able to T-Wave, like it got a little bit weaker now because it's not able to status Dark types, but it's still a really good Mon, and again, it depends on its value in your league. Um, always make sure that you're not paying too much for whatever you're getting. Like Klefki, I would take probably as a tier three, no lower than, like no no higher than that, obviously. Um, Crocodile, Crocodile, uh, obviously you guys can tell I'm going in alphabetical order, I think I'm in tier three now. Uh, Crocodile has been incredible. I had it in the PCL most recently, and I also had it on uh, Ray's team uh, when he when I replaced him in the GPC that was on his team. I ended up free agencying it and dropping Crook for Hip <coughs> excuse me for Hip Hauron, which I don't regret. However, Crocodile could have been very threatening later in the season. Uh, Hippo was good for the couple of games that it came. Crook would have been better later on. So, and I really enjoy the fact that it's a really good Zemon. Uh, it's got good dual stab, it gets pursued. It's probably one of the best pursuit trappers, uh, in my opinion, because it's bulky enough to take uh, psychic, uh, psychic Pokemon's attacks 
that have coverage for it, things like Energy Ball and whatnot. Uh, so it's probably one of the best Pursuit Trappers, the fact that it can run berries to reduce that damage. Uh, not having a quad weakness as a ground type is always really nice. The fact that it's a ground type, the fact that it gets Stealth Rocks, so, so good. Uh, mean Chow, um, <clears throat> it's kind of a 50-50 right now, but uh, I've had Mean Chow a couple of times. I've enjoyed it both times. And um, access to U-Turn, Fake Out, Regenerator. Uh, <laughs> what's really cool is that it's three abilities are all useful. Um, Regenerator, Reckless for high jump kick, and even Inner Focus. I brought Inner Focus uh, Mean Shao, I believe, against... Who was it? I think I brought it against Johnny in the last week of GPC Season 5 uh, because he had Jirachi, and I didn't want it to flinch me, and I could take a Heart Stamp or a Zen Headbutt with my investment, if I'm not mistaken, and I also had a Focus Sash, so I could blow the Jirachi back with a knockoff. So... Like, I've used Inner Focus, so uh, all of its abilities are really good, its coverage is really good. Uh, it's very fearsome to switch into because uh, Ghost types have to worry about knockoff and everything else gets pummeled by either High Jump Kick or like Poison Jab for fairies. So, uh, Mean Child is really good. Uh, Needle Queen, Needle Queen, arguably one of the best ground types uh, in Draft League format, hands down. Uh, it's bulky enough to take hits, it's powerful enough to break. Uh, it's just fast enough to beat the, uh, the walls that it wants to break. Uh, it gets access to Stealth Rocks, Taunt, it's a uh, ground type, it's a grounded poison to absorb toxic spikes. It does so many things, it's so good, it's so much better than Nido King 2 uh, because of its bulk. Obviously it doesn't have as much speed or as much special attack I believe. But, uh, and it can go mix too, that's, that's the cool thing, is that it uses Sheer Force to abuse the fact that it's, um, that it's offenses are a little bit lower. Uh, I really, really like it. I used it in March Madness, and I would definitely draft it again. It usually goes before me, but I would definitely get that thing again. Uh, Umbreon. <laughs> Umbreon is, uh, becoming, I think, one of my staple mons at this point. As much as I hate the fact that it's so passive, it doesn't matter. <laughs> there's you know how there's just some Pokemon that no matter how passive they are they're just that good that they're worth getting Umbreon is one of them I feel like wish protect foul play heal bell next week wish protect foul play heal bell next week pursuit uh, <laughs> wish protect heal bell like it's it's set hardly ever changes its investment varies a little bit but its role is important it's a Dark type that doesn't get nuked by ghosts with fighting coverage. So, like, I, I can take two Life Orb Gengar Focus Blasts with Umbreon. So, just to give you an idea, and, like, I can immediately Pursue Trap it. So, it's... And, and I did that. That's exactly what I did <laughs> against, uh, I think it was Freeze. Um, I caught his Gengar and, uh, as he was switching out. So, Umbreon, ridiculously good. Uh, I'm on that is very undervalued, I feel. Uh, a Selgor. I used it in uh, Miner Season uh, 3, and I really, really liked it. Uh, the spikes aspect, the, the fact that it's really, really fast, and that it can actually use its stab and its coverage effectively, like, it, most people will use it as, like, Final Gambit, Focus Sash, Spike Lead, but it's actually really good offensively because of its speed. Um, it matches Mega Beedrill and Mega Sceptile. In terms of speed, it goes to 427, so uh, Bug Buzz becomes very threatening. You can run it modest, and all of a sudden it's a little bit more powerful. Focus Blast, uh, I believe it gets uh, Poison Moves for Fairies uh, to cover the fact that Fairies resist Bug. Like, it's uh, it's pretty strong. It's pretty strong. I, I really like it. Uh, ditto. Oh, ditto. Uh, I used Ditto once. Geo. Shoutouts to Geo, man. Uh, Gym Leader Geo loves this thing. Remix. Um... I used it a, a couple of times, oh, no, sorry, one time, one time only, GPC Season 6, picked it up, first game it came in, did work, immediately, I was like, yes, <laughs> this thing is so good, and it was actually really good because a lot of Pokemon can't face themselves, either they can't hit themselves, or they can't take attacks from themselves, things like Lucario, for example, doesn't want to take its fighting stab, because of the fact that it's a steel type, like, there's so many instances like that. Dragons that are weak to dragon. Uh, like, I remember Ethan specifically running a non-dragon stab, uh, or a mono, sorry, a mono dragon stab Haxorus 
coupled with Jirachi to make sure that an opposing Ditto couldn't take his boosts and kill everything on his team. It was incredible. But like, that's the kind of fear, that's the kind of thing that Ditto does. And there's a lot of mons like this, things like Dugtrio, Gothitelle, Trappers. Uh, there's a lot of different mons that do this, but uh, there are certain mons that you draft not specifically, spe uh, sorry, specifically because they're going to come every week and do work, but them being there automatically puts something in your opponent's head. <laughs> and that is so valuable in draft. Uh, after that, we have Flygon. Uh, I really enjoyed Flygon. Uh, the two times I used it, uh, used it I want to say, or maybe it was just one. I think it was just one, just NPL Miners Season 3. And uh, Dragon Dance swept for me. Uh, it was a reliable defogger. It it did its job. It it did its job and it did it very well. It was a good ground type. It could switch in on electric type attacks. Uh, people always had to predict HP Ice or uh, Thunderbolt. And then I had a Kieran Black paired with it. I think the Kieran Black plus Flygon wasn't a bad pairing. Uh, and I would do that again. It's the rest of the team around it that I would change. Uh, after that, Miss Magius. Uh, I've only ever actually personally used it twice and both times very briefly uh upa this season where i just dropped and nba season three where that ended shortly but through that experience with Ms. Magius, i've already seen its potential and uh, i also helped johnny get to finals of the first got uh he almost didn't make it into uh bracket play um post pools basically he almost didn't make it in, and then I kind of like gave him a bunch of Miss Magius sets as we went along, and I was like, oh, this could work. And his Miss Magius set in, uh, what was it, semifinals was ridiculously good. Like, it was tailored to beat uh, Mega Blastoise through its Dark Pulse. Like, it would take the Dark Pulse, it had a Cobra Berry, it would pain split enough health back to take the next Dark Pulse and two hit KO it with energy ball. Like it was it was ridiculous the things that we did with Miss Magius, the fact that it gets Will-O-Wisp and, and whatnot. It's it's a really good utility mon. It's usually really cheap, so it's some, it's a good ghost to look at and its speed tier is really good. Uh, I wanted to put Seismitoad on this list. I've only used Seismitoad once. And again, UPA season five, I wasn't there very long. I still enjoyed it. It still got caught by hidden power grasses, but it still did its job well. And I've seen what it's doing elsewhere, and I'm impressed. So I want to give huge shout outs to uh, specifically Shoddy and to Seismitoad. Um, some people call Seismitoad Shoddy, like Jolt. But Seismitoad has been doing a lot of work, and uh, I can appreciate what it does for a team. It's really good. Uh, it's a secondary ground type. I wouldn't get it as my only ground type, uh, personally, unless I'm actually forced into it. But because then it's predictable, you bring HP Grass, and that's it. But um, it's uh, it's, a, it's a very good ground type on its own. Like it, it's solid. Um, and then we get into the tier fives. So there's only three here. Uh, Gorgeist, I had a lot of fun with. Another really good cheap ghost uh, fills an important role as a grass type on a team. Gets Leech Seed, Will O Wisp. Uh, seed Bomb can be run offensive. Typically, most leagues will let you run any form. Um, that can be really useful for adjusting its speed tier in consequence to specific matchups. It's a really, really good cheap pick. Uh, Pillowswine uh, is, is another one. I mentioned Mamoswine before, but if you can't get Mamoswine, get Pillowswine uh, because it's it's still a rocker. It's still a nice charter. It's still got ground ice stab. It still gets freeze dry. It's got all these things. The only thing I think it's really really lacking is knockoff uh, as opposed to Mamoswine. So there's that. Uh, and then finally, I have Weezing. He had another mod that I've only used once in NPL Miners. But I want to give a huge shout out to Weezing uh, because it's a really good poison type with only one weakness. It's a really good physical tank that really, it's a, it's a good glue mon for teams. So it's definitely something worth looking at. So that's pretty much everything. Uh, we're pretty far into the video. This is going to be a long video. I just want to <laughs> warn you guys right now. You've probably already seen the time, but uh, we're down two points already. So next up, I want to move into... Um, Things probably that have um, influenced the way that I draft. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, my drafting specifically right now. So uh, obviously I just named off a bunch of mons that I really, really enjoy drafting. So every draft I try to try something new and see what mons uh, I end up liking and which ones I don't. So obviously there's a full list of mons that I don't like, but I won't get into it because it's it's too big. So I don't want to get into the, those specifics, plus it would take a 
huge amount of extra time. We've already gone through enough time. So uh, things that I look for in draft. So I don't look for Firewater Grass, Fairy Dragon Steel Cores anymore. I don't do that. I look for Pokemon that work together. Typically, uh, a dragon will need a fairy and a fairy will need a steel and a steel will appreciate a dragon. <laughs> like that's that's just normally how it goes. Actually, a steel will more so appreciate a fairy, I think. I think those are the two more complementing types. Um, whereas dragon, you can, you can not have a dragon uh, on your draft and you can be fine. You guys hear noise in the background? Don't worry about it. But anyway, um, basically you can run uh, a draft without a dragon. Uh, so fairy dragon steel cores, not necessary. Firewater grass cores, another uh, core that's n not a necessity uh, in a draft. Although it is great because uh, grass types can be good arrows checks. I did mention thousand arrows before from Zygarde. Uh, there are two Zygarde forms you always have to watch out for. So. Grass types can be good there. Fire types are normally good breakers. Things like uh, Infernape, Embor, Darmanitan. Uh, Arcanine can be a breaker. It's a good defensively, of course, as well. Uh, you have a bunch of Blaziken, a bunch of good fire types. And then you have uh, waters, which are typically bulky mons. And people will normally go for waters because they only have two weaknesses. Uh, they typically get good recovery. They're bulkier than other Pokemon. So that's typically why you, why you will find a fire water grass core on a team. Uh, but you don't have to have one once again. So that's not necessarily what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for, uh, very specific things. Uh, I really like Dragon Dance. That's one thing that uh, I will almost never again go without because Dragon Dance is the ultimate setup. Uh, increasing your attack and speed simultaneously is uh, probably better than any other setup. Better than Nasty Plot, better than Agility, better than uh, Calm Mind. Cal I think Calm Mind is second to uh, Dragon Dance personally. But Dragon Dance is like an absolute necessity in my opinion. So uh, that's something I love drafting. Uh, in terms of priority, now there are some people like Jolt that, <laughs> specifically Jolt if you're watching this, that like every kind of priority they can get their hands on. I'm not really looking for as much priority as possible. I'm looking for very specific priority moves. Um, I did mention Ice Shard. Ice Shard is super, super important because there are too many sweepers that uh, rely on you not having a form of priority that equals ice. Uh, so Garchomp, I said it before, Garchomp, Zygarde, Salamence, uh, Lando T, things like Staraptor, uh, Braviary, like anything that has an ice weakness doesn't like seeing Ice Shard on the opposing side. And there are so many of them, guys. There are really that many that I absolutely lo love Ice Shard. Which is why Weavile, Mamoswine, Pillaswine, Sneasel, these four will almost always get drafted in a draft. They'll almost always go because Ice Shard is so valuable. And I think it, it has to be the number one priority. It has to be number one. Uh, second, Bullet Punch. Bullet Punch is really good because a lot of threatening fairies, things like Mega Deancey, Mega Gardevoir. I didn't have Mega Gardevoir in my list. Oh my god. Uh, I didn't bring up any of the Megas that I used, actually. Mega Gardevoir, Mega Blastoise, really like those. I uh, just want to put that out there. They're the ones that I've used most frequently, and they're the ones that have come through the most. So, anyway. Uh, threatening fairies like Mega Deancey, Mega Gardevoir. Um, there's, there's quite a few. Um, and there, you need to be able to stop their setup or stop them from getting out of control in a way. Bullet Punch is the best way to do that. It can be argued that Aqua Jet can deal with things like the Ancy, but Bullet Punch across is just really good. And Steel is really good offensive typing. It can hit a lot of things really hard. There are very few resists. Uh, and other setup sweepers like Rock types or just anything in general. Like it's it's hard to find a resist to Steel that isn't Steel. So that's, uh, that's why I really love Bullet Punch. Sucker Punch can be argued. Uh, up there. It's really good for psychics, but it's so predictable. I never want to click Sucker Punch. <laughs> it's just a move that I never want to click because it's not reliable. People can play around it, and I don't like those mind games. I don't like being on the receiving end of mind games. I like playing mind games uh, with, like, against Sucker Punch and being the one to click status moves on their Sucker Punches. 
I don't like being on the other end, so I'm not sure I love Sucker Punch. E Speed. Extreme Speed is so good, whether you're looking at Entei, Zygarde, uh, even things like Lanoon. E Speed is really, really valuable. Uh, Lucario, because it's the strongest priority. Uh, outside of, I think, um, First Impression. Um, but First Impression is limited to one mon, whereas E-Speed you can find on multiple different things. So, Extreme Speed, really, really good. I just want to see if there's any other form of priority that I am completely forgetting. Uh, priority Pokemon. This is not a professional video, just letting you guys know. Thank you. <laughs> let's, uh, let's see. Priority. Um, Aqua Jet by... I already said Bullet Punch Nice Shard. Uh, we have... Uh, Shadow Sneak's okay. A Cell Rock, if it was more widespread, would be, probably be really good. Vacuum Wave, Mock, Mock Punch. Mock Punch is probably right after E-Speed, in my opinion. Um, it's just kind of the same reason as Bullet Punch. It's really good for uh, beating things that can set up in front of you. Things like Steels, Rocks, uh, th those th sort of things uh, that you really, really need Mock Punch for. Uh, and I think right after that would probably be... Uh, yeah, probably be Quick Attack, and then Shadow Sneak. Yeah, well, Vacuum Wave, Quick Attack, Shadow Sneak. I would put Sucker Punch last, like, it's really bad. Uh, <laughs> it's, like, it's that bad. And then Fake Out, kind of like, Fake Out's a plus on a team. Like, you don't need Fake Out, but Fake Out's good. Um, it's a good thing to have. Other than that, uh, more and more, I'm, I'm starting to gravitate toward, uh, trying to make sure that I have two to three rockers at all times uh one that's less likely than the other two to come and just to put it in their head that there's a possibility that i, I could have stealth rocks uh on the third one the one that's less likely and then a spiker or and or t spiker uh so it's tough to get both in one it really is uh like your needle queens only get t spikes and like a cell gore only gets spikes but then you find your quill fishes like I have in the GBAD league that have both. So that's just a, a bonus. Like Jolt has Scallopede, that's amazing. Having both simultaneously. He also has five stealth rockers. The guy's insane. But <laughs> anyway, um, that's something that I really, really look for in a draft. Uh, what else? Let me look at my uh, let me look at my GBA draft real quick and see what I was thinking. Um, I want at least. Like, I want setup, obviously, on as many things as possible, if possible, but I also want just straight wall breakers, so I don't want to have to absolutely rely on my setup. Um, I got Metagross, not only because it's it's good defensively with my team, it's a good steal for fairies, but it can actually do a good job as a physical breaker because of its 130 attack. Um, Thunderous doesn't necessarily have to rely on setup to break because it has base 125 special attack with like a life orb with a um, With an expert belt with even wise glasses. It's really really strong Salamence can break through teams with a choice scarf without having to set up uh, because of its moxie boosting so uh, And then there's mega blastoise of course. I also have Zangoose So I'm looking for at least one to two breakers on each uh, Offense so on physical and on special uh, I'm really looking for that um, a normal type is something that more and more I'm looking for in a draft because based on the way that I draft personally, this isn't a general thing, but based on the way that I draft, I typically have a lot of ghost weaknesses and only one resist. So I like to have an immunity simultaneously just to uh, throw off my opponent. Obviously Zangoose, not the best immunity. It doesn't really want to switch in on anything but a ghost move, but uh, as long as that threat is there, it's there. So, I like that. Um, I always try to get a ground type. Um, I ended up getting a Firewater Grass Core, and as you can see, I have a Dragon type, and I have a Steel type, but I'm lacking a Fairy. Uh, fairies are really good. The problem with Fairies is that they're hard to get, <laughs> because as much as it seems like there were so many Fairies added, Bulu doesn't use its Fairy Stab too well. Finny isn't strong. Uh, and Coco, while it can use Dazzling Gleam, it's not on its most powerful offense. So, it's 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 tough. There there weren't that many. I would say Mimikyu was probably like one of the, but it's normally so expensive. So it's it's tough with fairies. Um, I like to have a defensive fairy as opposed to an offensive fairy. 
uh, best of both worlds kind of thing. I think I didn't mention this in my draft review, but I did get sniped on Sylveon uh, right before my pick, actually. I was going to take Sylveon in conjunction with Thunderous and Salamence, and uh, actually, no, I think this was the way back. Yeah, this is the way back. I was hoping to get Sylveon on the return when I got Cresselia. Uh, so Sylveon was my game plan. I was like, okay, I'm getting Sylveon. Sylveon's a good wish passer, and I defaulted to, to Umbreon after. But I like fairies that can perform well defensively and still do damage offensively if they need to. Like things like Florges can do damage. Uh, Sylveon can do damage. Uh, what else? What am I missing here? Like, a lot of the tier 1 fairies can't do a lot of damage with their fairy stab. Like, they're bad at that. So, um, that's something that I try to uh, make sure that I have is, is a fairy that can perform well defensively and still do damage offensively, basically. So, that's uh, that's that. Uh, and other than that, I don't think there's much else. I like to, to get a good amount of setup. Um, obviously, you guys saw my draft for the GBAD League. Uh, Thunderous Incarnate has set up, so does Salamence, Infernape, Cresselia, Metagross, Decidueye, even Umbreon with Curse, Quillfish gets Swords Dance, uh, and Zangoose gets Swords Dance. So, there's, there are only two Pokemon on my team that will probably never be setting up, and that's Piloswine and Mega Blastoise. So, everything else gets set up. So, it's, it's scary when you have to figure out what's going to be setting up. Um, I really, really like that, as much as humanly possible. Um, one thing that I've more recently been noticing uh is that well two things actually the first thing i want to talk about is hazard removal um a lot of people are gravitating away from hazard removal because or like as much as they used to draft it like everybody's like okay i need like uh two defoggers and a rapid spinner at all time and it's funny because i have two defoggers and a rapid spinner but i didn't pick them up for that reason mega blastoise i got Yes, because it has Rapid Spin, but it complements my team really well. Decidueye I got because it's a ghost and its its role is really nice as pivot with U-turn and it can check a lot of things really well defensively. Uh, the fact that it traps with Spirit Shackle as well, it's a ghost that essentially has Shadow Tag and a move. So that's really, really powerful. And then Salamence I'd never got for Defog. So it just so happened that I have that, but a lot of people are like, okay, well, I don't need as much hazard removal. What I think you need is uh, Fast Taunt. Fast Taunt is super valuable because it keeps the hazards away. I think you need to be able to identify what your opponent is going to be setting up hazards with and stop it if you can. Uh, if that can be a game plan. You don't, you don't always need to remove the hazards after the, they go up. You can stop them from going up in the first place. Like, a lot of people don't realize this. They're like, okay, well, I absolutely need hazard remover, removal. Sorry. Um, but realistically, like, if you have one defogger, one rapid spinner, that's great already. If you only have one defogger, but it's a super reliable defogger and it's likely to carry it, sure. <laughs> like, why not? That's, that's really, really good. So, uh, a lot of people are starting to realize that hazards aren't as huge of an issue. Uh, plus, there's there's always the, uh, the fact that rocks hit certain things for super effective damage, and then whatever rock stone hit spikes do. So, it's kind of like, at the same time, like oh, your, your mons are only taking half of the hazard damage if you build your, your team correctly, so you can never really get two hazard stacked. If you have a grounded poison, you beat the toxic spikes, so all of that stuff. So, uh, that's pretty much how I like to build my teams. Uh, two breakers on each offense, um, having uh, multiple setup options, Dragon Dance, having Bullet Punch, and Ice Shard, absolutely, I, like, I, I thrive for those, uh, having good bulk all around, and solid offense, like, you just, just know what you like, uh, after time you will get to find out, and that's pretty much what I'm getting to essentially with this video, is that uh, over time you will find out what you like, and what you don't like and that actually brings me to my next point this was something that i just wanted to touch upon really quickly um there was a big debate uh, a while back when envy drafted his uh his gba team uh his friends were sticking up for him saying that his draft was amazing and people in the draft league community were saying that his draft was awful but he would probably still do well with it which is exactly the case the, the, that's exactly what happened and everybody knew that because envy is really really good but there's something that you have to understand. VGC is different from Smogon. So is Draft League. You have to realize that, yes, you can see what your opponent is bringing. 
re reciprocate that. They can see what you're bringing. And they can take advantage of certain mons. And you can try to prevent that. But people will find new and interesting ways to take advantage of things that are either passive, don't have enough offense, and can't deal. Uh, they're, they're just mons that struggle in draft league format because it's difficult to bring them. There are Pokemon that fulfill that role much better, are way worth more worth the pick. Um, for example, things like Empoleon. I'm not a huge fan of Empoleon anymore. I used to be. I still love the Pokemon itself, like its design and everything. But in terms of draft league format, it's bad. It's, it's not good at what it's supposed to do. Envy utilized it really well. Why nobody was able to counterplay it? <sighs> you know what? I won't get into it. But it's not that great a mon to bring. Uh, or to have on a draft. There are much better options. Um, I, I, I personally liked MV's draft after seeing it like week one, week two. Uh, even after he lost to Gator week one, I was still confident that his team was going to do really, really well. And that's exactly what happened. Like, you can have multiples of a weakness and your opponent is still not able to take uh, advantage of it. It's kind of like the uh, the four times uh, weakness argument, where the more four times weaknesses you have, the worse it is. When in reality, the more different four times weaknesses you have, the harder it is for your opponent to prep and know which hidden power to bring. So it's, it's kind of that same dynamic. So uh, I just wanted to say that, yes, some mons are more viable than others in draft league format. And you have to uh, take that into account. You have to respect that. And people have uh, have grinded and found out which function better than others. So you can't just say that every mon is good. Because that's not true. The reason we have a tiering system in Smogon is because Pokemon that are in lower tiers typically will not thrive in the higher tiers for too long if they're overly exposed. Like, I'll, I'll go back to Envy. Envy sometimes brings up random mons and does really well with them and because he has a surprise factor, right? Should that specific mon start seeing a ton of play, it will see counterplay that it prevents it from being alive in the tier anymore. Like, it will not exist. So, pretty much, th there are exceptions and that's why we have breakthroughs of mons that pop into tiers like for no reason. Uh, but typically things stay where they are because they're more or less viable and it's the same thing in draft league format yes you can see what your opponent is bringing but again they can see what you're bringing and the more things you have on your team that are easily exploitable or not that strong the worse your draft is so that's just something i wanted to touch upon really really quickly now moving on to my next point uh is building so obviously once you've drafted your team and you're gonna start a season your very first match, you have to build for it. So, uh, this is kind of more a personal thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, is that uh, my attitude and my demeanor toward building has heavily changed uh, in, I would say, the past three months, quite a bit. Uh, and it's the way that I approach it. So, um, I don't want to give away too many secrets, but basically, the way that I used to build was I used to look for a mon or mons that did really well in the matchup, put them on the team, and then uh, like surround them well and made sure that uh, they could do their job. The way that I look at it now is that I find one to two offensive threats that can put in a lot of work, and I make sure that the rest of my team can check my opponent's team defensively. So to make sure that one, nothing is walling me and that I am walling them. So that's very tough when you get two really good players up against each other, obviously. But um, I'm dropping coins here because I'm playing with coins. All right, we're going to put this down. But anyway, um, so that's obviously very tough when you have uh, two really good players up against each other. But I think that building process probably works the best. So the thing you're going to want to do right off the bat is identify which mons have the best time against your opponent. And then you're going to want to see which mons you're not going to have a good time against. And you make sure that you can cover all of those bases. As time goes on, and this is uh, really the, the big point that I wanted to make, is that as time goes on, as you continue to do this over and over and over again, keep building and keep 
noticing flaws in your building and um, and noticing what works over time your building won't just improve because you have experience and have seen sets it will improve in in a way that a lot of people don't expect and this is what happened to me recently you start seeing things that you didn't used to see before there are sets that pop out to you that uh you would have never noticed prior and all of a sudden your team building me mechanic and process works better and everything seems to just flow and that is really what i wanted to touch upon like that's that's the feeling that i've been getting lately as i've been building my teams for the npl majors for the gbad league is that i feel that i've gotten enough experience in draft league format to where i put six mons down and the likelihood that i'm not using five out of the six by the time i'm done with all of my preparations is 0.1 percent because i immediately see what works what doesn't and it ends up working and it's just it's confidence that you build as you uh as you continue building and uh and playing uh as you go along uh and it's also just it's knowledge and intuition so the, these are things that you gain as you play more and more draft league formats so for anybody that hasn't played it yet uh, jump on the boat. It's uh, it's still a relatively new concept and it's really really fun. So get into it uh, Next thing I want to talk about is uh, after you're done building There are different things that you can do to help improve your matchup So before you actually have the game one of those things is mocking So for any of you that don't know what mocking is it's a term that kind of uh, I, I would say took uh, got a lot of uh, attention within the last year and a half or so sorry for the long pause but it's it's a term that really took off in the last year and a half or so uh, between people in the draft league community and it's basically uh, it's, it's a mock battle so obviously the word mock is not a new word but the terminology that we're using for it in draft league format uh, has come to the point where it's called a mock battle so basically what it's called what it is rather is that before you have your actual game, you get somebody who has not seen your build of your team yet to build with your opponent's team and face off against you to see if your team matches up against what they think is the best um, combination of Pokemon. So I was, uh, and Jar can vouch for me here, for a long time I was against mocking not that I wouldn't do it because I would still do it, but I heavily debated its impact positively and negatively on a player. So obviously positively, it can give you confidence in a matchup if you end up winning your mock battles, uh, and it can help you identify what can be wrong with your team, what needs to be changed. Inversely, if you win too often, if you get two, three mock battles, and all you're doing is winning, and if you're newer to the format, and this is what would happen to me sometimes, is that you come in with such confidence in the team that you've built, and you're winning all your mock games, that you're sure there's nothing that needs to be changed, and you end up looking overlooking something very, very important. And that is very crucial for anybody that is slowly climbing the ranks in uh, draft league format. You need to notice this with mock battles is that, um, so that I used to call this an, uh, an inherent problem of mock battles, but only to a certain extent, only to a certain level of player. So as you're getting better in draft league format, you need to notice that, uh, you need to notice your own tendencies as a player. If you're the type of player that says, okay, well, my team is fine. Everything's good. After you've had one or two mocks and you're not looking at the bigger picture, you're not looking at things that could have potentially been threatening but weren't because you crit something, or it got burned, or it, it died to uh, stealth rocks because you played around it decently. Uh, if you're ignoring a threat or you're not noticing a game state that could have occurred, uh, and as a result you're not making necessary changes to your team, you need to adapt to that. You need to fix that, it's a problem, and it's something that only originates in mock battles because you wouldn't gain the confidence from um, from anywhere, 
realistically. You wouldn't gain that confidence from anywhere if you didn't have a mock battle. You wouldn't be so sure of yourself that your team was perfect unless somebody pretty much reinforced it. It's, it's kind of like positive and negative reinforcement simultaneously. It's kind of bad, but as you grow as a player, as you gain experience, as you uh, get better at noticing your own tendencies, like I said, you will pick up on when something is not right. And uh, this is something that happened to me the other day. I kind of blew up at my mock partner because things were not going my way in the game at all. And I was like, what's wrong? Uh, there was a lot of unfortunate hacks against me, but I've had unfortunate hacks in other mock battles where they still don't end up making me lose. So I was like, okay, hold on a second. Um, I got really, really angry. I got to back up for a second. This mock, this is just a mock battle. Let me relax and let me see why did I lose? And I identified the problem and I was like, wait a minute, okay, there's actually something wrong with my team here and it needs to be fixed. And I'm looking at this matchup wrong. So I made the necessary change, had two more mock games, uh, and I didn't lose a single one. And the change was made and I was more comfortable going into those mocks than I was the first one. Because the first one I wasn't sure about the team and then it didn't work. And then when I made the necessary adjustment, I, I knew in my mind that the adjustment that I made was correct and that it, need to be, it needed to be made. Despite me being so sure of my first build and that it would work and it didn't, I was still able to modify my team and be happy with the end result. Because I let go of my ego, I was like, you know what, it's fine, I made a mistake, let's fix this, let's change this. Let's try again, and it worked out. So that is something, that is another thing you gain with time as a player. I just wanna see how my hair is, sorry guys, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit vain. But that's just something you gain with time as a player, um, and you, you learn to, to recognize those situations. Uh, that can be kind of, uh, I would say, transferred into everyday life as well. Uh, you start to notice things about yourself, and you uh, make sure to make necessary corrections, whether it be to your personality, your your family, your love life, whatever it is, and you make those corrections and you get better at it over time. So uh, it's the same thing with mocking. So I think that my initial stance and opinion on mocking was nearsighted and I needed to uh, grow as a player to see that uh, mocking is actually beneficial. You just have to approach it correctly. So that's, that's my stance on uh, on mocks, essentially. I had identifying matchup as a point as well, but I think it kind of fits into the same thing. It's that as you keep playing, you will build this intuition that you will know what to do with a team when you see it. Uh, there are some people that build multiple teams. Uh, Jolt is one of them, and I was actually surprised to hear this. I was like, you build multiple teams for one matchup, and he tries them out in mocks. He tries out multiple different teams, and um, that's how he basically goes into a matchup. Like he has multiple different teams. He finds the best one, whichever one works best. And he uses that one. And I guess he could have like 16 mocks in the process. If he has four teams and he has four matchups with each one, then, you know, um, then he has 16 mocks. But if that's what works with him, for him, that's what works for him. You will find your, your pacing as a player. You will find what works for you. So moving on, um, one of the last points here, uh, calking. So... Um, this is, I, I mean, it kind of fits back into, this is really during the game, by the way. Um, this is, you're in the heat of the moment, you're playing the match out, and you are, uh, getting hit and hitting things in return. And if you're not calcing, uh, hits that seem strange, or even, you know what, scratch that. If you're not calcing every single hit to check what just happened and why it did that kind of damage and what your opponent could be. And if you have to be looking all over the, the calc to make sure that you have not overlooked anything. Uh, if you're not doing that, then you're losing out on valuable information that your opponent can have. 
And this is one of the reasons that I made that HP bar for Wi-Fi. I use it on OBS. Why? So that I can see exactly what HP my opponent is at. Is it is a tool at my disposal? Is it against the rules? No. It is something that I can I can easily glue it. I can print it out on transparent paper paper and glue it to my DS screen if I want to. Is that cheating? No. It's a tool at my disposal, just like a calc. A calc is a tool at your disposal that you can use to better your matchup, make it easier for you to play out the game. I know it's stressful sometimes, especially for newer players, to calc and play at the same time. If you're playing on showdown and the timer's not on, calc away. Like, calc as much as you need to. If you're playing on Wi-Fi, you have a time limit, which is why I would personally suggest starting on, on a league, starting with a league that uses um, Pokemon Showdown as their main uh, m motif, uh, n not motif, but their main platform, excuse me, uh, for playing on. So I would start there personally because you're not limited to a timer and uh, you can really do your calcs and not be too bothered. Um, and... On Wi-Fi, once you transition to Wi-Fi and you have a little bit more experience, you're able to do calcs a little bit quicker. You make sure that everything's set up ahead of time. You can import your sets on different kinds of calcs and uh, then you're good to go. So uh, that's that's a very important thing that I did want to mention because uh, I know that there are some newer players probably that are watching these videos and uh, I know I have a lot of competitive players obviously on my channel, but uh, as subscribers, but I definitely wanted to make it a point that calcing, I know it's uh, it, it's hard sometimes and it, it doesn't click always, especially with me at the beginning, I, was, I wasn't calcing everything. Now I am. Now I am calcing every single little thing. And uh, some things I know off the top of my head, which is really cool, because when you're building, you're running these calcs and initially. You're like, okay, well, this thing is going to do between 21 to 28% to me uh, if it is adamant max attack. So like, I don't know, a U-turn <laughs> or something, right? If it's adamant max attack, it's going to be doing between 21 to 28. If it does 27, I know it's adamant. If it does less than that, I have to check my calc again. So it's something that you have to get into a, the rhythm of. Uh, so calcing is a huge, huge uh, part of draft league format. Uh, it's something that's very, very important because it's not like the smoke on ladder. It's not like VGC. Sets aren't exact. Um, they're not your copy paste sets everything is so tailored in draft league format you can bring any single set you want you can tailor your evs however you want them to uh to be to look like that uh calculating every single move is really really important because it identifies sets and it helps you for later in the game even if it doesn't even if it doesn't come back up what do you lose really you're losing a few seconds so uh get used to calculating if you're not already the last thing i want to talk about uh, and I, I think this is uh, an issue that's come up a lot in uh, a lot of leagues, actually. Uh, etiquette. So, uh, if, I, if I didn't say that slowly enough, etiquette uh, between players. So, um, this is one big thing that I see a lot of people doing. And I don't want to call out specific people, but people get hacks. We, what we call hacks, of course. Um, bad luck against them and they will default to complaining um, and blaming their opponents and uh, telling them that they made a wrong play and they got rewarded for it. We see a lot of this, people get frustrated. I understand getting frustrated over a game. Uh, I do it all the time. But you have to come back down to earth and realize one, it's just a game. Two, it's a game that you have chosen to play with the knowledge that these are things that can occur. Critical hits happen, freezes from ice punches happen, uh, max sleep turns happen, high rolls happen, everything happens in this game. And it's super frustrating when something doesn't go your way. But that is actually Z Zazo. I, I wanna bring up Zazo for a second, Iron Flash game. Um, he uh, made a very, very interesting point that once you've plateaued in draft league format or in Pokemon in general, and you cannot really get any better. And the only thing separating you from the other top players is luck. Uh, what happens in a game uh, and the determining luck to who wins essentially. And if it's not a completely clean game, if there's one odd turn where something goes in one person's favor, then that's just something you have to live with. 
<laughs> that's that's literally Pokemon. There is no avoidable way for you to dodge. There there is no foreseeable way for you to dodge hacks unless we were to remove all non-accurate moves from the game or give every move max accuracy, which makes no sense. Uh, remove critical hits, secondary status conditions, and everything else uh, that is unfortunate for one person or another. And we were to start a new format altogether. That game would be boring. <laughs> Let me just make this very clear. That game would be very boring and nobody would want to play it. So uh, what makes Pokemon fun and exciting is that random things happen all the time and it's uh, it's unpredictable. Uh, it's kind of, I want to make it a little analogy to Halo, actually. Halo was one of my favorite games, and one of my best friends, Derek, uh, he, he put this the best way possible. Halo was one of the best games for its time, like Halo 3, specifically, uh, because unlike other shooters, anything could happen, and when you'd go back into replays, you would see the most absurd things would occur, and that doesn't happen on, like, Call of Duty or, or other shooters. But Halo had that factor, and that's what made it so fun. Even though it wasn't the most optimal shooter of its time, um, and it, it didn't have some of the technologies that other shooters had, it was still incredibly fun because anything could happen. And that's one of the, the drawing points into Pokemon, is that anything can happen. And if you're basically saying that you're angry because of that, I, I'm going to be straight up with you. Don't play Pokemon. Just don't play because there's no point. You have to assume, um, you have to assume the game state. You have to assume the game state, the way that it is, the, the hacks that occurs, you have to get used to that. Uh, whether you'd be angry or happy, sad, all of the emotions that you feel, you have to understand that they're a part of the game. And I don't like seeing people going off on each other because of things that happen like that. They're part of the game. Just just get over it. Move on. Play your next match. It, it's okay. We get that you're angry. Don't take it out on the world. So that's just something I really wanted to bring up. Also, a big, uh, a big topic of debate in the NPL that came up uh, a little while back is that a lot of top players, like really good players, have a certain ego to them. And I can be faulted sort of of doing this from time to time but not really because i i respect all of my opponents and i know how good everybody else is to the point where i would not blame anybody for um making bad plays or uh losses or anything like that like i have my moments i think i mentioned in my latest uh npl video that verd uh essentially wanted to lose the game because he stayed in on my diggersby with uh his arcanine had he lost Arcanine, he lost to Heatwave Spam. So, yes, that is something that could have happened, but ultimately Verd won. So there's nothing I can say. He, he won. He made the correct play in that instance. Uh, as much as I see it as an incorrect play, uh, it didn't end up being an incorrect play. My play was the incorrect one. So there, there's nothing that you can do. Those things happen sometimes. What I really don't like seeing, though, is when uh, people go off on each other for when they think that their opponent made the wrong play and it cost them the game. If they made the wrong play and it didn't work out in your favor, then whatever. <laughs> it's, it happens. Just get over it. Um, there's always... So, some of the best players in draft league format will bypass that. Like, they won't care if you made the right play or the wrong play it'll always work out in their favor because they've planned accordingly so uh and they've prepped accordingly of course so that's what really differentiates the uh good players from the great is that you have players like gypsy king and iron flash gaming that uh they they take no matter which situation and uh they always make the uh the play that gives them the most out of the turn uh, regardless of what their opponent does so they factor in every possibility they make their play accordingly and they end up winning a majority of their games as a result so uh, gypsy went undefeated in npl season five almost lost to ray uh i <laughs> just want to put that out there but yeah uh that that's something that i really hate seeing is that when people uh basically try to discredit their opponents of wins because 
uh, things didn't go their way. So I, I'm really tired of seeing that. And if you're new to the draft league community, uh, it'd be cool if you don't do that. <laughs> if when you're starting out, uh, if you are mature enough to uh, not shit on your opponents, basically, uh, when things don't go your way, that would really help out the community as a whole. So uh, for everybody that is trying to grow this into something bigger, and I know that there are a lot of people out there, myself included, that would like to see this rise to uh, a standard format essentially like have it, it'd be difficult to to make it a, a widespread thing to make it esports essentially but uh if it's a dream then it can it can be made a reality so uh but it, it will not be made a reality as long as the etiquette remains as it is right now as long as people are always attacking each other so that needs to stop in pokemon uh that needs to like there need to be a, a vast majority of people that don't tolerate it as opposed to people that do it so that it occurs less and less in the community is essentially what I'm saying. So that's pretty much uh, draft league format for all of you guys. Uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. There's nothing else really. Uh, I'll try to leave some links in the description, uh, probably to uh, leagues and people that I mentioned during the video. So definitely make sure to go and check them out if there was anybody that seemed really interesting to you that I was speaking about, maybe somebody like Jolt or Ray, uh, definitely go and check them out in the description. It's not like product placement or anything where I'm trying to get them views, but like Jolt has more views than me, so it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that's pretty much the video, guys. I hope you guys did enjoy and learn something from this and took something away from this. Um, if you want to go back, uh, look at my drafting style or anything like that. Also, uh, by the way, if you go to my videos, uh, to my, my channel, to, if you actually go to my channel, the very first video that's there, that's my channel trailer is me linking my discord. If any of you are not already in direct contact with me on discord, join my server. And if there's anything that you want to ask me about or talk about, uh, in regards to this video or anything at all, anything that you've seen from me, uh, then do so through my discord server, tag me. I am, or even leave a comment down below. Like, uh, I'm willing to, to help anybody who needs it. So, uh, definitely do that. I want to, like I said, I want to try to grow this community as much as possible, as much as anybody else does. So if anybody has any questions, anything that they want to, uh, to ask me or clear up, or, uh, if they need advice on anything, like people come to me for advice on drafting. Uh, quite often actually I had somebody that that um, I don't want to say pestered because uh, I don't want to seem like a, a negative thing but was constantly asking me what he should do with his with his draft very recently and I gave him step-by-step -step pointers as to what he should do uh, and ultimately he ended up making the draft that he wanted to make but I told him well look this would work better with this so try to go this route uh, make sure you have a, a lot of physical offense. I was telling him all these things. So, uh, and I, I don't know who he is. <laughs> so like if he's, if he's a subscriber of mine, great. Thank you very much, dude. I appreciate it. Um, if he's not cool, it doesn't matter. Like it, it, it really doesn't matter. Anybody that needs my help, come and see me. You guys have the link to my Twitter, uh, as well as my Facebook page down below. You have the comments section. You have my discord now as well, if you want to join that. So, uh, that's everything that I wanted to talk about today, guys. Uh, again, I hope this was helpful for everybody that wanted to watch this uh, in its full length of probably about an hour and a half, I would assume at this point. Um, thank you all so much for, for sticking with me. Uh, as usual, uh, make sure to hit that like button down below. Subscribe if you have not already, and I will catch you guys later. Ciao.